And as we begin to sing, we, the first song always makes me think of a kind of a song of, of, of longing uh, as we're, we're looking for God to work in our lives and in this world. So let's stand and sing. Advent gives us opportunity to reflect on the idea of dwelling. We know from the historical accounts of the Gospels that Jesus dwelt on this earth at a specific point in history. Our Gospel reading this morning will mention one of the names for Jesus from the prophecies of Isaiah, Emmanuel, or God with us. The people were being led to the understanding that God was now dwelling with them in human flesh. Matthew 1, 18, 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, 
because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. As we continue to think about dwelling, three beautiful thoughts come to mind. First, that Jesus said in John 14, 17, that the spirit of truth would dwell in us and be with us as we place our faith in him. Second, our primary focus is not on this world, for although we dwell here, we are but sojourners and pilgrims on this world. Finally, when we pass on from this world or when Christ returns, a second time, he will take us to dwell with him for all eternity. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that Jesus came to live the perfect human life so that he could become the sinless sacrifice for humanity. And we thank you that as we place our faith in him, he promises to be with us always. Allow your indwelling Holy Spirit to sanctify, uplift, and enliven us. Help us to remain in you and in your love as you command. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 7. It says, uh, insert in the bulletin if you want to follow along. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remuliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shirabashab, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Because of the fierce anger of Rez, because of the fierce anger of Rezin of, and Aram and of the sons of Remuliah, Aram, Ephraim, and Remuliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, "Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tebal king over it." Yet this was what the sovereign Lord says: It will not take place; it will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remuliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience, patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father's a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for flies from the distant streams of Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the crevices of the rocks, on all the thorn bushes and at all the water holes. In that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the river, the king of Assyria, to shave your head and the hair of your legs and to take off your beards also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two goats, and because of the abundance of the milk they give, he will have curds to eat. All who remain in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, in every place where there were a thousand vines worth a thousand silver shekels, there will be only briars and thorns. Men will go there with bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. As for all the hills once cultivated by the hoe, you will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where sheep run. At this time, for children's church, uh, children uh, grades kindergarten through second grade uh, are free to walk out to the, uh, to the new elementary classroom, and there should be someone meeting you there. Children's church grades kindergarten through second grade. Last Sunday, I, um, in the afternoon, early evening, I guess it was early evening, I stopped by church to get a few things ready for youth group to go grab some things. I, I guess that's where I made my mistake. My second mistake was that there was a, a car parked near the uh, light out there by in the parking lot. And it was a, uh, a white car with the, the trunk lit up. And um, I kind of caught my eye. So I looked over and the lady uh, looked at me. And uh, the minute I made eye contact, that was second mistake number two, um, she launched into a story. She's like, is that, it's just like I was telling you earlier today, I've lost my cat. And I said, well, uh, you haven't spoken to me earlier today. I've never seen you before. I don't know you. So she spoke to somebody here. Um, so somebody knows the cat lady. All right. So she launched into this story of for 10 to 15 minutes about how she has found a place where there's feral cats and she's picking them up one by one as she traps them and taking them to the vet to, uh, to 
spay and neuter them. And she had one in her car and she opened the lit door for some reason and it popped out. She was over at Fenster's flea market. I know a lot of things. And it, the cat came running over and she was looking for it all day. And then she put out a, she's like, there's a trap over there by the, uh, a live trap over there by the trees. And I'm trying to trap it again. I don't know where it went. And the whole time I'm like, I, don't need to know all of this. There was a lot of detail. I skipped over most of it. Uh, but it was one of those encounters where you're just like, I never thought I was going to be in this conversation for this long at this place. I thought I was doing one thing. It turned into something completely different. That's the experience King Ahaz has. Um, the armies are coming. He's worried about his city. So he's doing everything he knows to do to make sure the city is ready uh, for the dangers coming. So he's checking the water supply. Uh, the water supply was a, is a major problem for any walled city under siege at this time period. If the enemy can cut off your water supply, they can cause you to have to surrender. Go out, come out and fight or surrender. And at that time, the, the water supply in Jerusalem was very much a danger because it flowed over ground and you could be stopped up. Uh, this king's uh, son, Hezekiah, uh, says, you know what, we got to do something about this. He digs a tunnel underground to take the water so that enemies can't stop the water flow. Uh, and they refound that tunnel in the 1800s. It's still there. You could crawl through it if you go to the Holy Land yourself. I don't know if they let you, but it's there. But we see in this story, we see in chapter six that King Uzziah had died. And then his son, King Jotham, his reign of 16 years falls between chapter six and chapter seven, because in chapter seven, we're on to King Uzziah's grandson, King Ahaz. Now, King Uzziah and King Jotham were both, the, the grades they were given in scripture are good grades. They were people, men who uh, followed the ways of the Lord. They weren't perfect. They didn't do everything right, but it says overall, they did right in God's eyes. But now King Ahaz is king, and he will be king for 16 years as well. But his assessment in the book of uh, 2 Kings is that he did not do what was right in, the, in God's eyes. Just a couple quick examples of ways he did not do right in the eyes of the king. Uh, in, 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 in 2 Kings and then in Chronicles, it adds to it and it says, he was a king who was willing to sacrifice sons to the fire, to the god Molech, to kill his children for prosperity in the land. That's the kind of king he was. He was the kind of king that uh, when he went up to visit the king of Assyria later and he went to visit him at Damascus, he saw that the people group that was just defeated had a really, what he thought was a cool looking altar. So he sent back plans ahead of himself so that they could build this special altar for him at the temple site. And they pushed aside the true, t the God's altar, the one that God designed, and they put in this new altar. And he said, you know what? This is an awesome altar. I love how it looks. To a God who was up in, uh, in Syria, in Aram, who had already demonstrated defeat. And that's, that's the God he wants to worship on this altar. And, he's, and he goes and he, he actually makes sacrifice on it himself, which again, in, in true uh, Judaism, it would only be the priests who could do that. So that's the kind of king. But let's talk about the political situation they're in. The, the king Ahaz and the entire region is greatly worried because of the growing threat of Assyria. Like, we, like we've been talking, they're getting more imperialistic. They're rattling their sabers. They're saying, we're coming. We want more land. We want more control. We want more people. We want more people to pay us tribute. All right. So the, this has been going on for, for years now. And the, for the two kings before King uh, Pekka, who's now the king of the northern kingdom, king of uh, Israel. Um, one of the previous kings, Menahem, had paid off the king of Assyria to leave their land. So Assyria had already come to, into the northern kingdom, and they said, what are you going to do? We're here now. And they said, can we pay you off? Can we pay you a large tribute so that you leave us alone? And then that's what they did. They paid them and they left. But now they know this is gonna, can happen at any time. So the current king of Aram or Syria is Rezin. The current king of Israel is Pekah. And they form this Palestinian alliance. They say the only hope we have is if all us small countries team up together so when Assyria comes back again, we have some hope to fight off their army. And so they said uh, first to Ahaz's father, Jotham, join us in this alliance. Jotham refused. Then they said to Ahaz, join us in this alliance. And he refuses. 
And so Aram and Israel, the best plan they come up with, we've talked about this before, is they said, okay, let's go and attack Judah and force them to join our alliance. That's the plan, as nonsensical as that sounds. Let's weaken both of ourselves to make us stronger. And if you read through the Old Testament, the stories there, you see that uh, there was one battle in which Judah lost 120,000 soldiers fighting against this alliance. So this is a real enemy. This is a real danger. And they lost control of some of their cities. They, they turned some of their cities to, over to Syrian control. And they came and they went throughout um, Judah. And they took, uh, on one occasion, they took 200,000 captives, women, sons, and daughters. They took them captive and marched them up to Israel so that Syria and Israel could use them as slaves. And then Oded, a prophet, came to the leaders of Israel and said, this is wrong. We're in sin, but this is even wrong for us to take our, our cousins, our brothers and sisters and make them slaves. No. And they actually listened to Obed. Some of the leaders said, we don't want to pile sin and judgment on top of our nation over what is already here. And they released them back to Judah. But what else is happening is the Philistines are coming and the Philistines are greatly weakened at this point. But now Judah is so weak, they're coming uh, nibbling for scraps on the side. So now Philistines are attacking from this direction. The north, they're attacking from the north. They're attacking from, the, from what would be their uh, western side. That's what's going on. So King Ahaz is stressed. He's frustrated. He's like, there's dangers everywhere. There's the danger of Syria. There's the danger of Israel. There's the danger of the Philistines. There's the greater danger of Assyria. There's dangers all around, and they're real dangers. So here's how it assesses that in, in verse 1 of Isaiah 7. It says, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Rem Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. So on one of the first occasions, they come and they defeat most of the villages, but they don't get through the walled city. Now, the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. Ephraim is simply another name for Israel or the northern kingdom. It was the uh, uh, population-wise largest uh, of the tribes, and the first king of the northern kingdom was from Ephraim. So they can sometimes call it Ephraim, just like they call it Judah. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees are shaken by the wind. They're fearful. They're fluttering. They're, 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 they're nervous. There's all these real threats out there. And how do you take that? How do you prepare? How do you, how do you be settled in your heart? And then the, he has a meeting with a prophet. God instructs Isaiah. He says, take your son and go speak to King Ahaz. Bring your son, Shir Bashem. This is probably the, the first son of Isaiah. We went out of order on, on Thanksgiving Eve. We talked about his second son. We'll, we'll kind of swing back around to that. But this is his first son. And his first son, it's not as specific. It doesn't say that God gave him a name. But I don't think anybody would name their kid this unless God told them to. So his name means a remnant will return. He says, take your son, a remnant will return, and go visit the king. Now, I kind of always see these stories for some degree of where the humor lies a little bit. But you can imagine as you bring your small child along with you and you say, uh, a remnant will return. You know, hi, King Ahaz, I want to talk to you a second. A remnant to return? Catch up here. Now you stand here, a remnant will return. I'm going to talk to King Ahaz, a remnant will return. And while I'm talking to him, just please be quiet. So as he's saying this name over and over and over, do you get the message that the king's getting? That's why God had him name him something like that. So that every time he says his name, and we say little kids' names a lot, don't we? That they're going to hear this name and he's, gonna, he's reminded. What is that message that he's getting? It's, it's twofold. It's a message of hope that says there's always hope because a remnant will return to the land. That's the main idea. It's a message of hope. A remnant will return to the land. This son is giving us hope, but embedded in that hope is what? That dire warning that before you can return to the land, what? There's going to be an exile. There's going to be a captivity. You will be taken out of the land. So even as he's saying this, a hundred years before it happens, even as he's saying this, he's saying, no house of David, that there is always hope, but know that it's coming. The exile is coming, and that's what's in his name. So he says, bring him along just for the uh, message of, the, of his name. And he says, I'll tell you where to meet him. Meet him by the aqueduct at the upper pool. 
because he's checking out the water supplies because the enemy's coming again. So he's doing every preventative measure he can to protect his people. And in verse 4, he's, God says to Isaiah, say to him, be careful. Keep calm and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. He compares these two kings. He said, this is like when you build a fire and there's still a little bit of smoldering going on, but that edge of the, edge of the uh, log there, it, it's not going to burn up. It's just going to smolder for a while, then it's going to go out because it's not enough heat anymore. That's those guys. Because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aaron and of the son of Remaliah. He's like, okay, let's, we're looking at your current threat. But we're also going to be in a second looking to the future threat. And he's going to warn him about that. But he says this, he's, he, he's saying this threat is real. Uh, he, it's a political threat. It's a physical threat. They're coming to attack. And it threatens the very foundation of their lives. But he's saying in the midst of all of that, be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. And Isaiah is doing something else here. He, he doesn't, he never says King Pekka's name. Uh, and it's a little bit of a, um, he's not showing him honor. Because uh, he isn't in the line of a dynasty. He, he was an official who assassinated the last king to take charge. So he's like, he's not even a real king. I'm not even going to mention his name. I think, uh, I think his dad was this guy. And in verse 5 and 6, it says, Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade you, to let, let us tear it apart, and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabel, Tabel king over it. So they have a plan. They said, let's attack it, let's defeat them, and, then and the name is a Syrian name. Tabil is a Syrian name. And King Rezin has a buddy who wants to be king somewhere, so we're going to put him in charge, and he will certainly join our alliance, and then we'll all be allied against Assyria. That's the plan. Verses 7 and 9. Yet, yeah, this is what the Lord Almighty says. It will not take place. This is, again, what Isaiah is supposed to say to King Ahaz. It will not happen. As the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only Rezin, uh, within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Do you hear what he's getting at? He's saying, look, the... The head of this country is this capital city. The head of this capital city is their king. And he says that. He goes through both of the attacking parties. What is he trying to get King Ahaz to realize? He's saying, what's true of you? Okay, so the, cap, the head of Judah is Jerusalem. And the head of Jerusalem is the Lord Almighty. That's what Isaiah is trying to get Ahaz to think about and acknowledge. Who is our head? It's not only a king. It's not only a man. The true king of Jerusalem sitting on his throne is the Lord Almighty. That's the reason you don't have to be afraid. That's the reason you can remain calm. And he's saying all this not based on the fact that he's not trying to say by calling them smoldering logs. He's not saying Aram or Israel are weak. They just defeated Judah. They're not weak. So it's not based on the weakness of their opponents. It's based on God's presence and his power. That's why he's confident to say these things. And he gives this very specific prophecy about 65 years. In 65 years, Israel won't even be a nation. What is that pointing to? Because they're defeated way long before that. Well, what that's pointing to is after the defeat of Israel by Assyria, and after the captivity of most of the Israelites and taken out of the land and taken away, there's another king of Assyria who comes, King uh, Ishar Haddon. And King Ishar Haddon had a new policy, and he makes this policy about 65 years from this, where he says, let's not let that land go to pot. Let's not let it go to waste. Let's fill it full of foreigners, and then they can pay us tribute. So he starts the policy of filling the land with other people. And it was in 65 years that the land was so full of people that there was not really any longer a hope, like there was in Judah, that if they could find their way back, they can repopulate and become a nation again. There really is no more hope for Israel anymore because the land is occupied. It has, it's full of people. Those people that we know to be the Samaritans of the New Testament. And Isaiah uses a play on words here. And the NIV tries to capture that because the two verbs are sound-alike words in Hebrew. 
He says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Some other uh, translators tried to capture it too. Um, I saw one translation said, is your, if your faith is not enduring, you will not endure. That's kind of the idea of what happens in the Hebrew. One person put, if you have no strong trust, you will have no trustworthy stronghold. That's kind of the idea. The words have sound very similar. And then he says, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. He says, listen, I know the enemy seems so big. I know what I'm telling you seems unlikely, that you will not be defeated by Aram. You will not be defeated by Israel. You will not even be defeated by the Assyrians. I know it doesn't sound possible, but I'm telling you it is. And I'm saying, now ask me for a sign that I can demonstrate to you so that you will know that Isaiah's message is from the Lord and that this is truly a message of the Lord. Ask God for a sign. And he says, I'll, I'll, from the deepest depths to the highest heights, do you want an earthquake? I'll send an earthquake. Do you want lightning to, to come down? I'll, we'll send lightning. Do you want fire from heaven? We'll send fire. Do you want a falling star? Well, I'll do a falling star. Whether it's down in the earth or up in the he heavens or wherever it is, anywhere in between, I will do that for you. But Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, we remember what kind of man King Ahaz is. And here he is quoting scripture. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. But he's using it the same way that Satan uses scripture in the temptation. He's using it for his own purposes. And sadly, it, it makes a statement. Here's a man who actually at some point studied the word of God like he was supposed to. As king of Israel, he's supposed to study the word of God, and he did. Remember, he had a godly father. He had a godly grandfather. They raised him hearing God's word, and he could quote it. But in a situation like this, he was using it to his own benefit. The verse itself, what's the meaning of the verse? The verse is when the people said, you let us into the wilderness, and now you're going to let us thirst to death because there's no water out here. And they weren't trusting that God could keep his promises. God says, I'm going to get you to the promised land. And they said, you can't do it because there's no water. It was a statement about them not trusting God, not trusting his promises, not trusting his provision. And how is he using it? He's saying, I don't trust that God really wants to give me a sign. I don't trust that I can really believe this sign, so I'm not even going to ask for one. He's going against the very words of the verse he's quoted. And what I think is going on here is I think Ahaz already knows what he's going to do. He's already come to the conclusion of what he thinks is the way out. And what he's going to do, which is what exactly he does, is he goes to Assyria and he says, can I give you money, become a tribute state, and can you attack Aram and Israel for me? And he didn't really want any message that advised against that plan. Because he had already thought, done all the thinking, all the process, and then he knew that was the best scenario. So that's what he was going to do. And what we see here is he uses scripture, but this outer piety is just trying to deflect his lack of faith in God. He knew what he was going to do. It was going to be a demonstration of having very much a lack of faith, but he puts piety in front of himself so so hopefully people don't notice it truly what's going on is that he was lacking discernment to follow god's lead god said here's what i want to do here's the opportunity i want to give you and i know you're a man who doesn't have faith but i want to give you an opportunity i want to open a door for the possibility of you to have faith and he lacks any sort of discernment to see what God was doing in and for him at all. Verse 13, then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough you try the patience of men? He said, this is, this is difficult for me as a prophet to hear you. God says, I will be happy to do something to demonstrate this is really God. And he's like, no, thank you. He's like, that's frustrating for me. He says, will you try the patience of my God also? Can you believe how frustrated God is that God is offering this beautiful gift? And he's like, I don't, I don't want it. 
Isaiah was coming to him to call him to faith, to give him one more opportunity. God has this gracious moment to plant this spark of faith in King Ahaz and change history and change the, the direction of the future. But this really serves, in a sense, as Ahaz's last chance before his heart was absolutely hardened, where he's not going to hear from the Lord anymore. And notice what Isaiah does. In verse 11, he switches. He says, your God is willing to give you a sign. When Ahaz says, no, thank you, he goes, okay, let me tell you what my God is going to do. If you don't want him, he won't be your God, but he's definitely my God. Sadly, it reminds us that signs do not really bestow faith. They're more an opportunity to confirm faith. To argue that point, the, the, the Pharisees believed that signs gave faith. But look at the men who left Egypt. Look at the men and women who left Egypt. That, that desert was covered in bodies of people who saw lots and lots of signs, but never came to a level of faith that they could trust God to lead them in right? And why do you think the great teacher, when the Pharisees kept saying, give us a sign, give us a sign, give us a sign, he said, I'm not going to give you a sign because what it's, it's not going to bestow faith in you because you guys have already chosen not to believe. It's not going to do it. It d merely confirms faith for those who people who do believe. And that's, why, that's why even the sign of Jonah that he said, I will give you the sign of Jonah, his very death, burial, and resurrection. I'll give you that sign. And for people who don't want to believe in it, like the Pharisees, all it became was a rumor to refute. A troubling story to try to come up with reasons why people shouldn't believe it. Did even that give them faith? No. He goes on to verse 14 and 16 through 16. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of two kings, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. There's a lot written about this in the commentaries. There's a lot of uh, people that argue this point. Okay, what is this talking about? Because as we've already read in Matthew 1, 28 and 29, the gospel writer Matthew said about Jesus, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken through the prophet. What prophet? Isaiah. The virgin will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So some people say, well, this, this sign was only ever about Jesus. No, I disagree. How could it serve as a sign to Ahaz if it was always just about Jesus? That's not really a sign for Ahaz. Isaiah said, this will be a sign for you, even though you didn't want one. So that some people go to the other side and say, okay, so was Matthew using this incorrectly? No, absolutely not. He was led by the Spirit to understand that this was absolutely about Jesus. People also debate the idea, does it have to mean virgin? Well, the Hebrew word doesn't have to mean virgin. But it does typically, most, most times it's used, talk about a mature, unmarried woman. Which would be, by definition, mean a virgin. And when they translated this passage into the Septuagint, when they translated it into Greek, they specifically used the word virgin. And when Matthew used it, he used the word virgin. What does the word mean? Virgin. So don't ever, don't ever question that. But this passage, like so many others in scriptures, has a first fulfillment and then a second fulfillment. It has a first fulfillment and then a second fulfillment. To Ahaz, and some people debate this. People ask the question, you know, could this have been Ahaz's son, Hezekiah? I don't, the timing's not right on that. Could this have been Isaiah's son uh, because he was giving his kids special names? That's a, I mean, that could be a possibility, uh, but that would mean that after, he's already had a son, so his wife isn't a virgin. So that would mean she would have had to die probably in childbirth, and he would be talking about his second wife, which gets a little complicated. All I think is going on is... As he talks to Ahaz, I think by himself, he says, listen, there's going to be a sign. What's going to happen is a woman who's close to you, somebody who is in the palace circles. There's going to be a woman who right now is unmarried. She's a virgin, but she's going to get married very soon. And they're going to conceive very soon. And when that child starts eating solid food, 
around two. When that child around two can say, when, can understand the idea of right and wrong, by that point in time, in about three years or so, all these troubles that you're looking at right now are going to be gone. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be someone who comes to you because this is a possibility because the, 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 the situation was so dire. I imagine he's like somebody's at the palace. Some, you know, maybe she's a cleaning lady at the palace. And he says, oh, Alice, I heard you just got married. And she's like, yeah, I just got married. And I'm, we're, we're pregnant. And, I, I, and, and, and she has a son. And he says, oh, what'd you name your son? And she says, I, I named him God with us. Because, boy, with all these things happening with, Assyri with Syria and with Israel and with Assyria, we really need God to be with us. So I just wanted, I just wanted to make that his name a prayer to the Lord. And then uh, Ahaz is going to say, what, what did you name your son? I named him Emmanuel. And so this sign is going to come to him without, without him asking for it. And within three years of Isaiah's prophecy... Aram was conquered by Assyria, and Rezin was killed, and he was the last king of Aram. And Pekah was assassinated by his own official, and he's the second to last king of Israel. So Rezin is dead. Aram is absolutely defeated. Pekah is, is dead, and the Assyrian captivity has begun. Within three years, the two enemies to the north the kings and the countries are no longer threats at all to, to Judah. And you say, this is still a little confusing because is it talking about the idea of understanding right and wrong, the age of accountability, which is so important to the Jewish mindset around, around 13, that you would understand and be accountable for your actions? Well, I think it is maybe spoken in a way that's slightly confusing perhaps, but we can see that God might have done that very much on purpose because in another 10 years, in another 10 years, so 13 years later, when the kid, this, this son that was born in prophecy is born, at that point, Israel is completely conquered. There was a period of 10 years where they came back a couple times and defeated them a couple times because they would revolt and they would take them away and then take more people away. And so by the end of the 13-year period, Israel is no more. So every word of this prophecy comes absolutely true, as no surprise to us. And then we'll get more into the second fulfillment. But notice that when he gives this prophecy, he doesn't just say, King Ahaz, listen to this prophecy. What does he say? This is a prophecy for the house of David. The whole nation needs to know about this because this is going to have a, a soon fulfillment and a more distant fulfillment. He says, the Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. He says, sadly, that's, all, that's the good news. There's also bad news in this prophecy as well. There's going to come troubling times. Because once you don't listen to what I've, what my call to faith that he was calling to Ahaz, once he's decided not to listen to that, he says, what's going to happen is you're going to invite Assyria to the land. You're actually going to pay them to come. And when they're here, they're not going to be satisfied. They always want more. They're going to attack you as well. And there's going to be a brokenness to your country that's more profound than any brokenness since the north separated from the south. And he says, unfortunately, Judah and the kings of Judah always want to trust in Egypt for alliances to protect them or Assyria in alliances to protect them. And he says, you know what? Both of those countries are at my control. I can whistle and they can come. And he says, He says that I'm going, to use them to, I'm going to use them to punish and to judge you. Someone thought it was a, a request. <laughs> uh, can you please whistle? <laughs> so we, if you didn't hear, we just had a whistle in here. All right. <clears throat> he says, Assyria is like a hired razor. You paid them and you, came, you went to the temple treasury and took treasury from there that belonged to the Lord. And you gave it to Assyria to come and rescue you. And all they're going to do is come and strip Judah of their masculinity, of their power. They're going to leave them shamed and humiliated. Remember, there's story after story. If you want to shame and humiliate an adult Jewish man, shave off his beard. But he's saying, we're going to do it all. We're going to shave his head. We're going to shave his legs. We're going to shave his beard. And he's going to be humiliated and shamed. And the picture here is a little confusing because we, we, we hear this, and it sounds a little bit like the land flowing with milk and honey. But that's not the picture. The picture is that they're so devastated and the land is so devastated that they 
abandon agriculture, that they abandon civilization, as it were. They live as nomads would. So the idea of curds and honey here is the idea that if you can find wild honey while you're looking for food, you'll be overjoyed. The idea is curds, you, uh, curds are uh, when you have milk and you let it um, curdle a little bit and then you can scoop off the top like a, like a yogurt. So why do you have that? They have that just like nomads would have that, but they have that because, and he says, do you see what it says? A guy who's a farmer and for his family, if he can keep one cow and two goats alive, he thinks he's doing great. And why do they have extra milk? Because the land is so devastated and the, the attack was so devastating that all the baby animals are dead. So they don't need to provide milk for their young. All of it can go to the family. And that's all they have to live on is this curds because they, have, they can't even drink the milk quick enough. They turn it into yogurt so they have a little bit to eat for later. That's the picture. It's not a joyous picture. It's a horrible picture. And it says that the vineyards and the cultivated fields are just going to be overtaken with briars and thorns and the land is going to be used for grazing. He says, that's the future because of your choice. And so when you think about the sign of Emmanuel, and we talk about it every Christmas season, every Advent season, we talk about Emmanuel, and it's so appropriate. But what a good year to think about the context of the message of Emmanuel. Here was a baby being born in a time of trouble and outward stress and pressure, and the point the sign of this baby being born was to communicate to them that God was with them. And in its second fulfillment, in its ultimate fulfillment in Christ, there was a baby that was going to be conceived and born to a virgin. Not only was, when Isaiah spoke, he was talking to a lady who was a virgin at that time, but within three years, she has a two-year-old kid. He's talking now about, with Jesus, it's going to be conceived and born as a virgin, one of the very first miracles of the incarnation. And he's saying to a people under the boot of the Roman Empire, to a people that are crushed because of a sense of their own spiritual death and the sin that is against them still, this baby boy to be born of a virgin gives them the message of Emmanuel, that God is with them. And the message of Emmanuel is for God to say, I know about your troubles and difficulties. That's what he was saying to Ahaz. That's what he was saying to the people of Bethlehem. That's what he's saying to the whole house of David. That's what he's saying to us. I know your troubles and your difficulties. I know that you are tempted to fear and to worry. What was it? What did we sing in the old, a little town of Bethlehem? Your hopes and fears of all the years. We know that you're under fear. But Emmanuel, I am with you. That's the message. That's the context of the message of Emmanuel, of the sign of Emmanuel. And it's on that very basis. That's the entire basis by which Isaiah said to that man, said to that king, and could say to us, be careful. Be careful how you think. Be careful where you let your mind go. Keep calm. Trust in me. Know that I'm here. Know that I'm with you. Trust in me. And don't be afraid. How do you say to a man who's just lost a major battle like that, don't be afraid? It's this idea that Emmanuel has conquered death itself. We understand that even in death, there's nothing to fear. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. That's the message of Emmanuel. We invite you to rise and worship with us.
Dear Lord, our prayer goes out for any of those experiencing violence and trouble in this time. We pray especially for the believers that they would always know that you are with them. That as we or people in Ethiopia or people all over this world go through these difficulties, these trials, let them know that you are with them. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen.